He has control over you. These things are no longer enslaving you and keeping you at this place of pain. See, the devil works all of these things together sometimes, right? So you look at my life. Okay, maybe I have a hurt. My dad abandoned me. I never met my real father. He got my mom pregnant, and he bailed, and I never got to meet him until I was about 39 years old, right? So because of that, I have these hang-ups where, you know, I feel a little bit inadequate. I feel a little bit less than, so i got to try to overcompensate because i got to prove my dad wrong, so i got to attempt to succeed. And then because I feel pain from that, maybe I've got to go out there and I've got to use drugs on a regular basis to heal me from my pain. Do you see how the devil uses all these three things, hurts, habits, hang-ups, all together? He brings them in a big mix and the solution is one thing, it's Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ is the one who could set you free. See, freedom from hurts comes in forgiveness. Freedom from habits comes in repentance. Freedom from your hang-ups comes in love. Perfect love casts out all fear. Psalm 27, 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold in my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? See, the, the problem is that he's not the stronghold. He's not the center. These other things are. That's why there's so much anxiety in our life. But there is hope. Many people have been freed right here in this place during our weekend services. Many people have been freed right here in this place through our small groups. Many people have been freed right here in this place through our Celebrate Recovery Ministries. People gather here every Friday night um, at 7 p.m., and they're in a place where they could be real, where they could freely share in a healthy environment, where they could walk up in confidence and tell others about the issues that they have in their life. My life is wrecked because I got a divorce. My life is wrecked because of pornography. My life is wrecked because of my, my addiction. My life is wrecked because of X, Y, Z, right? And they're coming here so that they could get freedom from that by putting Christ first in their life. They're with other people who realize that we're all on the same boat together and we're helping one another grow through our pains. That we're not a place that's going to go out there and when you reveal whatever issue you have, we're going to bash you. See, there's churches that are trapped in legalism. There were guys that came up here this morning after it and said, I went to this church and I revealed that I was having trouble with alcohol and they kicked me out. I'm like, man, they don't quite get it that we all have issues and fall short of the glory of God, right? We all have areas of sin in our life that need to be dealt with, so we need to create a healthy, grace-filled atmosphere where you're not permitted to continue on in your sin, right? If he continues to drink, that's obviously a sin, but we need to help him get through that in a loving, grace-filled way where the gospel does its work in his heart and in his life where he's freed once and for all time from that bondage in his life, right? So Celebrate Recovery Tuesday nights, Friday nights is a wonderful place for that to happen. I'm not telling you to come up here after the service and confess before everybody, oh, I've got this going on in my life. There would probably be no wisdom in that, right? Because there's wolves in sheep's clothing even within our own midst. Hopefully you're not one of them. Amen. Hallelujah, right? They'll say, oh, so-and-so shared this, and oh, we're going to go tell everybody about that, and we're going to bust on them and talk bad about them. You need to use great wisdom and discernment with who you share these deep issues with because if you've got brothers and sisters who genuinely love you, they're not going to condemn you for those. They're going to help walk you through them so that you can return to a place of healing and hope. Am I telling the truth, Billy? Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. So let's look at our lives and realize that Jesus has been through what we're going through, yet was without sin, so he brings us hope. Hebrews 4.14 since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one whom in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet is without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we re may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. See, our human tendency is that of the first Adam, that when we find ourselves in sin, we go find our leaves and we sow them on and we go hide in the bushes. We don't want to get called out. We don't want to get caught, right? So we go hide in sin. But what this scripture is telling us is that when you are in sin and you don't harden your heart, that you should actually be running to the altar. You should be running to the front. You should be running to the throne room of grace. You should be thrusting yourself on Jesus and saying, you did what I could not do for myself. I need your help. I've tried in my own power time and time again. I can't get over this hurt. I can't get over this habit. I can't get over this hang up. Jesus. Jesus, I need your help. We should be running to the cross, 
not running from it. So if you're here and you're trapped in any of these things today, run to the cross, that place of forgiveness and health and healing. Amen? All right, let me ask you a few questions, and then we'll start to bring this service to a close. We talked about moving from examination and reflection. We're going to do just a little bit more about that. Then we're going to move on to our plan, and then we're going to act, right? So at the beginning of the year, we passed out to many of you these things called gospel life plans. We encouraged you to fill out these questionnaires, and we went back to you, and we challenged you based on your responses to deal with certain issues in the area of your personal, your missional, and spiritual life. If you didn't get yours back, hit us up at the office. Some people's got caught in spam. We want to make sure you get those so that you can move forward and put it into practice. But the question becomes, if you received one of those, have you began to put it into practice? Or if you've been here during our weekend services, are you putting into practice the things that we've been talking about? So let's talk about worship for a minute. It's everything we do all the time. So if you view worship as whatever's happening in this time slice on the weekend for an hour and a half, if that's worship to you, we need to redefine what worship is. Worship is every interaction that you have. Throughout the course of the day, it's your finances, it's your job, it's your relationships, it's uh, what you watch on TV, it's everything that you do throughout the day, every conversation that you have, every action would be filtered through, Lord, will this next decision I'm about to make, will it bring you glory and edify you, or will it detract from your name? See, when we start to think in that way, that shows spiritual maturity. That shows that we're growing, that we're viewing worship through a different lens. So are you beginning to view worship through that kind of a lens? Community. If it was suggested that you plug into community, that you get involved in a small group, have you done that? See, community is an essential ingredient in the life of a believer. We're, we're to be around others who love us and can care for us and can be there with us, where we can grow with one another. Is, is the weekend experience a priority in your life where you're gathering together in the community of other believers like you have this weekend, even in the rain? Are you serving, right? Are you serving as part of that essence of community? Have you been baptized? I bring it back to that why Rick Warren in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, many years ago wrote about the fact that worship or, or water baptism has to do with an identification with the community of believers. So if you've not been baptized and you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you're actually standing in rebellion if you have not gotten baptized. It says that that's one of the first acts of obedience that we do. It identifies us in the natural and in uh, the powers and principalities that are watching to say, I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I'm going under the waters of baptism, dying to my old self. I'm being born again in newness of life, walking out clean, free from the sins that have enslaved me, and I'm walking out as a believer in Jesus Christ. So if you've not been baptized as an identification with the community of believers, I'm not talking about Journey Church, but I'm talking about as the overall body of Christ, you need to pick up one of those forms before you leave. Sign up and go under the waters next week and make that part of your life in Him. The final one is mission. We talked about last week how Jesus was sent and sending. He was sent to the earth on a rescue and restoration mission, and in turn, He sends you and I out on mission. Now, we need to begin to think of ourselves as missionaries to our neighborhoods, to our backyards, to this place. I read an article out of the Christian Post during the course of this week, and it said, they're training up missionaries to go to other countries from here so that they can coach the indigenous people on how to minister in their own context. I hope you get that. We're sending Americans from here to, say, Africa to train up the indigenous people so that they can be most effective in reaching the people of their culture. We've forgotten in our own culture that we're called to be missionaries. We're missionaries. He's planted you here on purpose for a reason in the neighborhood we're at, the job you have. All of this is a strategic plan by God to have you here at this moment so that you could be positioned to win people to Jesus so that you could live on mission. Some simple ways this very week. Go grab some of these cards, hand them out to people. Do the personal invite, pick up the phone, drive somebody here with you that they might come to know Jesus. You're, you're the indigenous people. Do we get that? Even if you moved here a month or two ago, you're learning to be an, an indigenous person, right? We are the indigenous people. We need to know the gospel and have it rooted in our lives that we can be transformation agents in our own backyard. I say all of this to really say, be maturing in your faith 
is an act of moving from being a consumer or an observer to being a participant. That's what it's really about, to participating, to acting on these things that we've been sharing. So I ask you these questions in, in all earnestness to just say, like, where are you at? Have you reflected on the plan? Are you moving forward? Are you growing in your walk of faith? Are these, these stubborn hurts, habits, and hang-ups holding you back? What's keeping you from God's best plan for your life? Would you rise with me and bow your head and close your eyes as I bring this service to a close? God's desire is that you would not be in bondage this morning. His desire is that you would be free once and for all time. So as you bow your heads and close your eyes, I ask you to just reflect. The power of the Holy Spirit, where are you at Have you grown in these past three months? If so, that is wonderful and praiseworthy. Man, that is just awesome. Are there areas in your life where personal, spiritual, missional, where you can just say, yes, I'm excelling in those areas. I'm doing very well.